Hi there, this is Kevin Raver from uh, Photo PXL, and it's been a long time since I've done one of these Zoom interviews, but this one's very special to me. And today I'm going to be talking to Stephen Starkman. Um, Stephen and I go back to roughly 2004, 2005, when uh, we had taken one of the very first Antarctica trips on the Luminous Landscape uh, uh, workshops and uh, got to know each other. And uh, all of us have all stayed in touch you know, throughout the years since then. And um, Stephen's um, kind of very special, and he's been fighting a very big battle. And uh, uh, he's been fighting cancer, and it's um, terminal. And along the way, and Stephen will tell us about this in a minute, uh, he decided to, to make a book. And um, uh, throughout the, the journey and the treatments and so forth, his book uh, is is very, very special and uh, documenting his journey as well as uh, some of the contributors who wrote in the book. Um, I sat down with this book with my wife and we were very touched by what we read. So let me introduce you to Stephen. And um, Stephen, maybe you could tell us a little bit about how it all began and uh, in your own words and what the experience was, um, what prompted you to see a doctor and what happened after that. Sure. Thank you, Kevin. I, I appreciate all the kind words. Uh, it happened to me rather suddenly. I woke up in the morning with uh, a, a very severe pain on the left side of my body. So I went to the uh, local emergency room and uh, walked in. And about six hours later, I had a diagnosis of cancer. So I, I wasn't one of those people who sort of like, uh, just had to wait for test after test after test. Uh, it's been um, very frustrating um, during the whole experience because of the the nature of the, the the disease. Nobody can really say you know how difficult uh, it can be for someone. Everyone has different thresholds of, of, of pain. Um, I'm you know quite amazed that I'm sitting here with you today and speaking uh, without pain. Um, but the, you know, the doctor was very, very deliberate in, in what his diagnosis was. And the type of cancer you have? It's a small cell lung cancer, which is very aggressive. Uh, it sort of spreads through the body like a, like a wildfire. And, uh, uh, you know, to the, for the most part, the statistics show that people have either maybe a few weeks uh, to live or they have maybe a year to live. And, you know, although I'm not a statistic, uh, it's uh, it's still something to grasp, uh, to hold on to and, and sort of like keep in the back of your mind, especially uh, before going into chemotherapy. I know a lot of people and... <laughs> I think about myself, what I would be doing if I was in your position. And um, of course, you know, you, you obviously do a, a lot of reevaluation and, you know, you probably kind of just say, I'm going to focus on certain other things in life and try to, you know, stay close to the family and try to get through this. But you took a, a different direction. You, you somehow or rather somewhere along the line and tell us about that, decided that you were going to document this. Yeah, I was in a critique group. Uh, run by uh, a gentleman named Jonathan uh, Blostein. And uh, at the end of that group, I sort of announced to, to the people who were there that I had uh, cancer. And then I showed some work. And this was very early on. This was probably just a couple of weeks afterwards. And they all encouraged me to document the work, to actually to document the story and to to make it into a book or make it into a project that uh, that I I could take you know solace in uh, over time. So it was it was quite amazing what they were uh, able to do. The, the title of the book is "The Prox Proximity of Mortality: A Visual Artist's Journey Through Cancer," and of course. When you hear somebody's going to document their journey like that, you expect to see, you know, a lot of hospital scenes and walking around hallways with, um, you know, the IVs and lying in beds or sitting in chairs, you know, taking all the different uh, medications that you must. And um, you didn't approach this journey in that 
that way. Um, explain why, rather than approach it in that literal sense, as I would have expected and, and seen many people in, in some ways do throughout different medical journeys, you, you know, you've kind of added photographs of your own along the way that that touched you that probably you know, we're part of how you were feeling. So maybe you could elaborate on that a little bit and why you broke the so-called, you know, norm of what we'd expect from a documentation of, um, you know, this, this, this journey. It was really a decision to, to document how I felt from the inside out. It, it really was um, uh, something that was important to me to, to sort of face all of the things that I would, be missing in uh, in the years to come. All of the familiar places, all of the familiar settings, um, everything from a pink cloud over the uh, over the lake to uh, uh, to images of people on a pier that, that are very distant and very far away. So I felt very sort of cloistered from from all that, and uh, uh, it it was something that I felt very proud of and very happy to to you know, to share with the rest of the world. You do have a few little hospital scenes in, but they're not the hospital scenes. They're elements of a, a scene in a right. hospital, if I can explain it that way. Um, you'll have to get the book. And of course, we're showing photographs, you know, here as, as we, we go. So you'll see some of those. Um, but that was a different, and was that a deliberate approach? I mean, how did you decide you were going to do that? Yeah, that was very deliberate. So I wanted to juxtapose the uh, hospital scenes from the uh, from the sort of metaphorical landscape scenes, and I, I wanted the sequence of the book to allow you to turn a page and then come face to face with the reality of what this means when you're suffering from cancer. So uh, uh, it, it was um, a very tough beginning and a, and a and sort of a, a static feeling of, of some sort of relief as time went on uh, in terms of the, you know, chemotherapy, losing my hair, losing virtually any concentration or any any sense of, of where I was uh, to move on to the, to the metaphorical shots that sort of spoke more about what I felt from the inside rather than from the outside. I'm looking at the book as we speak and... Um... You know, you have one scene where there's telephone poles and trees with glowing snow. You got another one with a prismatic, you know, flare from you know, looking at the, the sun in the sky. And then, you know, switch over to uh, looks like a machine that you're about to put your head through and, and like a, a CAT scan or something. And then you're back to ocean waves. And, you know, once again, the sun over a big horizon. I mean, it's and then back into the the medical scene. It's 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 a remarkable journey because I can read through these images, like you said. You know, there's this giant looks like a wharf with two people sitting on the very corner of it, overlooking a body of water. Then there's the body of the water, and you know, then there's a wall with like a hole in it and a body of water and a sky. I mean, these are very moving pictures. And you know, then uh, we turn the page and there's a picture of you holding on to all those medical instruments and IV bags and everything. And one of the few where, you know, you actually show a whole picture with, with yourself. But, and then I was most fascinated by the one picture that looks like a saw. I mean, the, the, it's totally different than anything I've ever seen before. But the more I reflect on every image when I'm looking at it, the more I'm actually feeling things and, and wondering things, um, I, I just kind of, find that whole thing just absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, and you have a shot of mannequins, that, you know, naked mannequins looking away. It's just, wow. Well, so were, were these pictures you took during your treatment or were these pictures that you pulled from your archives? They were um, primarily, well, most of them were from, from during treatment. A lot of them came from before. Uh, I don't think there's a photographer out there who wouldn't uh, – Claim that the pandemic affected their their photography, and uh, you know, I I sort of got into the cancer diagnosis um, um, midway through the pandemic, and the pandemic sort of put me at a at a in a different place. So instead of going out to faraway lands and and shooting people from you know distant uh, uh, sort of street scenes. I was much more in, enthralled with what I was doing at home, uh, but a great deal of the the work was done before 
uh, chemotherapy and then afterwards. Not to put a, a too hard a harsh a tail on it, but the, the chemo was certainly the worst experience the, that I've had in, in this journey. And I've also um, also mentioned before um, when we were speaking that uh, since the book was published, I've had brain surgery, and I, they did that to find a, a biopsy uh, to know how to treat the rest of it. So um, I'm waiting on results for that, and that's that's just been a few weeks ago, but, you know, relatively speaking. So um, you know, I'm in it for the for the whole nine yards. I mean, I'm going to see this through until I can't anymore. And, uh, you know, I, I'm really, uh, uh, I really talk a lot. <laughs> I yes, really it's, it's great that you can talk a lot, especially with all that you're going. I, I don't know if I could be doing and as courageous as you are with this from what I've seen well, done here. Quality of life is a really important thing. And there are, there are lots of resources for people. And I kind of caution people who, um, who might look and turn to Google and, and other sort of sources that it's not always what it seems that, that what you read is not exactly going to apply to you or what you, what you feel is going to apply to you. Um, but I've had many sleepless nights. I've had nights where, uh, you know, going to bed and lying down and, and just the, the, the crushing nature of, of how difficult that was uh, for me to, to do uh, meant that I had to alter how I fall asleep. So I've been falling asleep on the couch in the living room and let it sort of creep up on me so it doesn't, doesn't overwhelm me at night uh, because it really is an overwhelming um, experience. Uh, and then you, you're always in this this land of, of what's called scanxiety, so S C A N anxiety, and that's the the time between um, say an MRI uh, of your of my brain and a CT of the rest of the organs, and then you have this period of time where where you're not sure. And you're always uncertain and you're always afraid. Uh, and I tend to try to hide that fairly well. At least I attempt to the best I can. You know, I had melanoma at one point in my life. And while it turned out to be after, you know, they removed it and a few other things, um, you know, the, the scare kind of went away. But, you know, that that lived with me and permeated me so much, yes. you know, that, you know, at that point. And it was, would be kind of like a, you know, maybe a divorce where, you know, you go through this emotional period and then you have to deal with the reality of, you know, moving forward. People say these things come in steps. You know, how did you do that? Did you find that there were steps from the initial uh, diagnosis to uh, you know, where the treatment would come in and where the prognosis was as far as moving forward? To, to have that diagnosis in one day without having to wait and go back and forth. Uh, was a shock in and of itself to be scheduled for um, to be looked at for what type of cancer uh, it turned out to be, which is the small cell lung cancer. Uh, that was um, really shocking as well, because that's about the worst types that that you can find yourself having. Uh, and and then you you know you sort of go into a panic. I mean, it's it's really um, difficult to think of yourself as having this disease, which doesn't really give up uh, until it kills you. You know, it's a tragedy. It's it's it's, it's really. I mean, I can separate myself from it now, but you know, I, I'm going to die from this. I mean, that's the reality. Uh, I can't think of anything else that that will get me, and I can't think of of any other. Um, prognosis that would, that would come true they're all going to uh to be the you know the singular case of, of you know you died of small cell lung cancer and, and uh i probably about halfway through from what people say um of of what that is uh and i i kind of dread the future and i really do um i really am afraid of of where i'll be what i'll do um, 
there are things called action plans where as an example uh, just because i can't really get up and down very easily anymore um you know i we we bought an suv just the other day because uh sliding in and out of that car was much easier than than falling into a into a sports car and uh mm-hmm. You know, and then I'm going to have to deal with the, with uh, mostly the certainty of what's going to happen when I I uh, I can't uh, go to the bathroom anymore, and I can't get myself from one room to another, and you know the world just sort of closes in. But I'm only, I mean, I hear it in other people's voices, and that uh, it's it's really very very um, uh, disturbing. And uh, it's, um, it, you know, sometimes I'm at a loss for words. So I think this well, might be those things, yeah. I, yeah, I, I'm amazed that you, you can articulate so much the, uh, the way you have. Um, now, somewhere you decided to take up this book project, and you had to assemble this book and lay this book out and select images and come up with a theme and so forth. You know, having have you ever done a book before that helped you with this, or did you do this completely from scratch? Uh, I did a zine uh, during the pandemic. So before I was diagnosed, I did a uh, a zine of a uh, trip to Morocco. So that was kind of practice for it. Uh, but I'm I'm a strong believer in know what your limits are. And although I could select a lot of the images myself, I wasn't a designer. So I had a, a wonderful designer named Matthew Papa, who collaborated with me on the design of the book, and we went back and forth on a lot, a lot of that. And uh, I give him a lot of credit for for what he brought to the table. Are you still mobile enough that you can go out and take pictures? Are you still doing any of that, or are you working with your images that you already have? Knowing you, I, I can't imagine you just like throwing the towel in and 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 not doing something with. With, with photography. I'm at a stage where I, I find it very difficult to, to shoot, um, that I probably need to get back more into the, the, the spirit of it. Um, I have trouble bending. I have trouble, you know, being on my knees or lying down and, and, uh, um, you know, and, and to sit here and, and talk to me as you and I are doing right now, everything seems about normal. Um, there's no, you know, the, the, there's nothing that is terribly un, uncommon about the conversation we're having. Uh, you know, yet I, I, I have this this hope for for living as long as I can uh, and making as much use of that time uh, by shooting as I possibly can too. You actually have a body of work other than what we've seen in this. A beautiful book, and hopefully somehow or rather, we, maybe somebody carries that on as a, for lack of better words, a re- retrospective or something. Um, tell me a, a little bit about you know where you are with your family and so forth, and how you know they've come together to, to support you through this. Well, they've been absolutely wonderful, but it's it takes a, a real toll uh, on the primary caregiver. So. Uh, my wife Debbie is uh, absolutely um, amazing in, in what she can do and how easy she makes makes life for me, and uh, and how important it, it all is to her. Um, she gave up her her job as a real estate agent uh, some time ago uh, just to to help me cope when when I was. Um, when I was when I was more ill and I was less uh, less mobile and less able to sort of get around. Um, after the brain surgery, I can't drive my car, so that's why we got you know a new one. Um, and uh, and she takes care of everything about me. And there's it, it's it's really really tough because um, it's not just a matter of taking care of somebody for a couple of weeks or for a month or if you have you know a broken right. limb it's for the rest of their life and and it's progressive it, it gets worse um, 
I, I mentioned that I had a um, uh, an MRI coming up in May, and that Scanxiety uh, piece was, means that there's a um, consultation with an oncologist uh, a few days later. And uh, I'm scared to death of it. I just don't know what to expect. So uh, it's like living on pins and needles. But Debbie taught me how to put it away and how to compartmentalize it. And she was an absolute godsend to me to, to be in my life at this time. So I, I'm so thankful that, that um, we have such a, a powerful uh, love that uh, we can sort of help each other and take care of each other during, uh, during the course of this illness, which will, you know, which will leave her um, in, a, in a very difficult state. That's incredible. And, and you know, that's why we fall in love with the, the women that we have. And, of course, maybe yeah. they fall in love with the men. And I'm sure if uh, the roles were rever reversed, uh, you'd be doing the same for her. So, But if you seem to have um, a really good network of caring people. Some of the um, – I don't know what we would call this, the, the writings inside your um, – your your book are, are just so um i don't even know how to tell you how they move me and um yeah. certainly going to recommend that everybody uh if they possibly can get a copy of this book it's it, it's it, it, you you sit down and you kind of start going through it and you don't put it down until you're actually that through it and then it does nothing but it make you ask questions i mean the questions that i've asked to ask myself after seeing and reading about what you've done is a real eye opener, especially, you know, with today's world the way it is. So um, I don't know if you meant it to be a very thought provoking uh, piece, but it, it does provoke thought. It does provoke emotion. And it also, more than anything else, provoked a lot of sorrow, especially for people like myself that, you know, had an opportunity to meet you and, you know, do journeys with you and, and such. Uh, to know that you're you're going through this, and you know, having um, seen this recently with another friend of mine and his daughter, as well as you know what I experienced with Michael Reichman um, for all those years that uh, you know he he fought it. So you know, it's it it's but nobody nobody put anything together like you have in regards to the journey of it. So um, I I my hat is off to you. That it will live way past and say something to a lot of people in regards to that, especially people that may be unfortunate enough to, to have, you know, diagnoses in the future. So um, I can't tell you how, how much it's moved me. Well, I appreciate that, Kevin. That was really, um, that was really thoughtful of you and, and very, uh, and very touching uh, in and of itself. And I really appreciate those words. I really do. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share with um, the audience in regards to um, words that you like to give or advice or anything along those lines before we have to uh, part and go our different ways? Sure. Um, I, I think that um, even though every cancer is different, um, <laughs> there's a lot of commonality between different cancers uh, across the boards. So uh, I would say don't be afraid to ask your, your doctor if you have a diagnosis of cancer where you are in your, in your cancer journey. Are you at the beginning of it? Are you in the middle of it? Are you near the end of it? Uh, I think we all, as, as um, cancer patients, have a right to know that. And uh, it certainly helps for me to have some semblance of um, normalcy, and if if you would call it that, because uh, you can be statistically um, in error uh, and think it's it's going to uh, it's going to jump at you right away, and you're going to pass pass away right away. And there are other times when it isn't. And I should also mention. There's a whole host of, of curable cancers. 
uh, in this day and age. So there, there are ones that um, that are much more curable um, than than others, and that you know you may have a a, a real uh, chance at uh, at having one of the the curable cancers. Well, Stephen, um, it's been too long since we've spoken, and yeah. um, I, even though you know we'll put this up and share with our audience, please, you know, if, if anytime you just want to, you know, do a Skype call or a Zoom call and shoot the shit, I'm here, um, yeah. and um, you know, always available, especially if you just want to let loose or have a, someone to talk to, and. Um, uh, I, I don't know what to tell you. I mean, it's, you know, words can't describe it. I don't even know how to say anything. I, I, you're facing this with such courage and moving forward with, with such a, a it seems a positive uh, path and um, <laughs> with a dash of hope still there. Yeah. Um, that um, you, you, your message comes across very loud and clear. So, um, I wish you all the luck and, um, you know, that uh, the journey goes smoothly and uh, the way it hopefully could and that, you know, you, you don't suffer uh, throughout all this. It's actually kind of making my, me, me kind of miss the eye, to be honest with you. So, um, you know, that's all I really got to say about this. Um, so I want to thank you for um for for sharing it um we will put uh, a link uh, where your book uh can be obtained and purchased um and uh, hopefully some of our our audience will like to do that is there anything as far as um an organization if somebody wants to donate something to a cause that you're working with any of the cancer societies would uh, welcome your your donation so I've been working with the Canadian Cancer Society and been, uh, because I'm, I'm up here in, in Canada um, and uh, uh, it's very worthwhile. So, you know, invest. Excellent. Well, uh, we'll put some links to all these um, in the article itself and uh, in the video description and so forth. And um, hopefully we'll get some people to, to, to do that on your behalf and um, hopefully some people take a look at this book because it is a very moving book. Um, I only have the PDF version, but I do need to get out there now and, and, and get the hard copy because I think it deserves a place on my coffee table. Um, and that's, you know, where all my good books end up. So, you know, count on that. And, you know, I'll discuss that later. So at this particular time, Stephen, thank you very, very much for the time. I know this can't be easy. Um, it's not easy at all. But you, the the body of work that you made and the journey that you're on and what you shared with everybody um, says a lot about who you are. And um, I thank my lucky stars that I've had a chance to enjoy part of a good life with you on a good journey or two. And um, you know, let's stay in touch, please. Okay, absolutely, Kevin. Absolutely. Thanks. <laughs>